Here are our recommendations for the in-class meeting dealing with suprasegmental features. The title of the respective e-lecture is Phonetics Suprasegmental Features. As usual, you should start with a definition of your central goals. So, first of all, in this particular case, I would recommend that you go through all the topics you've dealt with up to this point with your students. Then, you should define the differences between segmental and suprasegmental phonetics, do some ear training with your students again, and finally, please don't forget secondary articulation because this is a suprasegmental feature too. Before you start with the practical, as usual, about 25% or so of the in-class time should be reserved for questions that the students might want to ask about the virtual session, about the e-lecture or the workbook content. The questions, for example, could be what are the basic segments of speech? They should be collected for future classes and for optional revisions of the online content. Since this is the first session on suprasegmental features, it is advisable to develop a list of topics in cooperation with the students about what they should know at this point in the class, or if you use this unit in isolation, what they should know prior to this class. So far, all students should understand how the field of phonetics is subdivided. Let me exemplify this with a short question and answering part with one of my first term students, Katrin Dillmann. So here is Katrin. Hello. So hi Katrin. Katrin, do you remember the three main sub-branches of phonetics? They all start with a small letter A. Yeah, I do. Uh, there is first articulatory. Okay. Articulatory phonetics, articulatory, yes. Auditory. Auditory phonetics. And acoustic phonetics. Acoustic phonetics. Okay, and alternatively, there's also a possibility of labeling them with three P's. Um, yeah, we can say production. Okay, the production of speech. The perception of speech. Okay, good and physics. Great. So this is what your, sh your students should know up to this point in time. And um, the students should have an understanding of the basics of speech anatomy, of airstream mechanisms, so that terms like pharyngeal, does that ring a bell? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Good. And I know she knows what it is. Alveolar or pulmonic airstreams are no longer unknown terms to them. So you could ask, for example, the question, what type of airstream is involved in all segments of speech? Uh, the pulmonic airstream. Good. Or you could ask your students something like, do you know any non-pulmonic airstreams? Uh, I know two more. Um, there's, for example, the velaric airstream, as in ejectives and in implosives, and the glottalic airstream, which we use mainly in clicks. Okay, great. So once this part and this general part has been finished, the discussion of suprasegmental aspects can start. To introduce the differences between segmental and suprasegmental features, a parallel with music might be very helpful. Do you play a musical instrument, Katrin? Uh, yes, I do. I play the clarinet. Okay, great. That could be of wonderful help here. If you play a musical instrument, you have some basic understanding. So I can ask her the question, um, what are the basic segments in music? Well, the notes. The notes, okay. So let's move some notes into my staves here. So, what a great melody this will be. Fantastic composers, you might say in the end. Well, just random. So, these are some notes on the staves. And um, now, in looking at the notes, we can ask the next question. What sort of effects can we produce in music that affect more than one note? Uh, for example, we can make the notes uh, loud. Mm -hmm. Or we can make the notes soft. Okay, and there are some symbols used for loud and soft? Uh, for loud it is an F for forte. Forte. Or a P for piano. Piano. And if I want to uh, apply this to several segments? You can use diminuendo. Which is as far as I think this sort of symbol. Yep, it is. And crescendo. The opposite. Okay. Is there any other effect than a change of loudness in music? Well, for example, you can make the notes longer. Okay, and what do I have to do then? Uh, you have to add a dot. A dot, okay.
okay so somewhere a dot is added so these are now long nodes there's in fact there's there's a rule how much longer they are if i add a dot uh 50 percent longer okay so this is a, a rule in uh, music or we can also i remember another one we can link nodes do you know what this is called if we if we link nodes that's called legato okay again a supra segmental effect in music so we have effects such as lengthening linking loudness effects and of course we can use notes with different tone height so we have things like c d e f g r h c something like that that was german by the way so it's not too bad you learn a little bit of german at least the letters um, so on many instruments we have tones just separate tones on some instruments we can even glide the tones into one another like on a violin okay so this is what we know about music what are the basic segments of speech the consonants and the vowels okay so this is then the equivalent of the notes in music and now all we have to sort out is that we have to find the equivalence of forte piano crescendo diminuendo and so on in human speech then we have the supra segmental effects so this is where we are at the moment basic segments of speech and we need supra segmental features let's look at the first one loudness now what is the physical counterpart of loudness um it's intensity mm -hmm. physics intensity and how is it measured in decibel in decibels okay all right so let's illustrate this here is a word an artificial nonsense word which could be pronounced something like kor ta mi tun and now i produce each syllable in the same level same height uh, same length and so on and if i want to make one syllable stick out from the rest on the basis of loudness i would say something like kor ta mi tun and which one did i emphasize the ta it's much louder the ta the second one so this one but of course as you know this is a little bit artificial so normally we don't do this in real speech okay let's take the next one the next effect pitch the physical counterpart of pitch Catherine frequency frequency okay and it can be measured in hertz in hertz very good okay now at this point as a teacher you can make an export x course into frequency analysis if you have time of course explain to your students terms like frequency amplitude oscillation and maybe hertz so once you've done this you can return to your word again here it is cor ta mi tun and now i want to apply a different pitch to one of the syllables so let's do it cor ta mi tun Which the one? third one the me the third one i sound like someone in church don't i a bit <laughs> <laughs> okay um all right so both effects loudness and pitch are of course totally unnatural normally to make a syllable stick out from the rest loudness and pitch movement go hand in hand and instead of marking the syllable by means of an underline we use a different symbol in phonetics but do you know which one uh, the apostrophe we use an apostrophe and the apostrophe is then a symbol that combines loudness and length into what is cumulatively called stress and this can be accompanied by length effects now this is the third supra segmental feature and the physical counterpart uh it's duration okay so physical duration how do we measure it in seconds well in speech rather than milliseconds okay milliseconds because we speak so fast again our word and now you see i spread the syllables out a little bit cortami tune and how do we mark length uh with a dot with yeah. two dots two dots okay so with a colon so this would be then cor corta mi tun could we make consonants longer for example the last consonant in the first syllable can you do that uh, corta mi tu very good not many people can do that but you can okay so this <laughs> is the effect 
of length. Right, having done all this, I think I would now do some ear training with the students and um, perhaps first of all apply to stress. So uh, let us combine our knowledge now. You can use your workbooks, you can use uh, uh, your notes and I will pronounce some words and then students have to write them down indicating the syllable that sticks out from the rest. So words could be something like this, nonsense words of course, something like pem to make, pem to make. The second one could be something like marsh thinel, marsh thinel. And the third one proj hast, proj hast, proj hast. Once you're ready, you show the solution. Well, here it is. Pem to make, mash thinel and proch has. And now the students can compare their solution with the model solution. And you can do the same thing in English. Now, English nonsense words would be something like um, the crumptious, the crumptious, the crumptious, or Battenheimer, Battenheimer, Battenheimer. And here is the solution the English solution and again you can compare your solution um, with the model solution. Again as you see and hopefully have heard stress is a combination of loudness, pitch and length. Next ear training would be tone. Now we can apply pitch changes to the syllables. Now what would you suggest Katrin? What can we do now in order to train tone sufficiently? Uh, well we could take a syllable and okay. simply change the pitch on it. Okay, so here could be a syllable. Ba, 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 ba. Any sort of tone. And now let's assume this is our level line. And now we want to apply some tone. So let's first of all apply a level tone to ba. Ba. Very good. And if you produce a rise. Ba. Good. A fall. Ba. Very good. And these three tones are of course the register tone because they constitute the basic registers of tonal movement in natural language. And now we can combine these tones and produce contour tones such as, let's use another color here, something like a fall rise, bah, or a rise fall, bah. And it's always a good idea if you produce these tones to accompany with then with gestures like ba, ba, then you find it much easier to produce these tones. Um, but do we use tone in English? Yes, I think we do, but not systematically. So tone in English, let's produce the English flag here and discuss that. We, we use it, but not systematically. Let us illustrate this. Um, let me ask you a very nasty question. What did you do <laughs> last night? Uh, I was out for dinner. Really? Now, what do you think about my answer? Uh, you don't sound very interested. Mm, not at all. What would it be had I said, really? You sound like you don't think that I would go out for dinner. <laughs> okay, but I, of course, I know you, you can go out for dinner, so that's not <laughs> a problem with my answer. So, this was just an illustration of an effect of using tone in English. So, now I suggest to use an example from the language index, you can practice here with tone in Chinese, for example. You can ask your students to read from transcription. Let's say they have to read uh, the Chinese version of the very big book. And here is the result. So the advantage is you can compare uh, transcription with your own pronunciation and the real pronunciation by a native speaker. Before we summarize, we should not forget another suprasegmental effect, namely secondary articulation. Here are the main types behind us. They have all been explained in the workbook, in the virtual session, in the e-lecture. So all you can do in class is possibly produce them, practice them. So let's do that. The first one is called labialization. Now, Katrin, can you illustrate that to us? Labialization. Yes, labialization. Labialization. So it's some sort of lip rounding, isn't it? It is. Okay. <laughs> and then we have 
palatalization. So you see the tongue in palatalization approaches the palate. By the way, you find the phonetic description, the diacritic on these uh, diagrams. Then we have velarization. Velarization. Yes, yeah, so your tongue was very high in the velar region. And finally, we have palate, uh, pharyngealization, where the tongue is very much in the throat. Pharyngealization. And you see the way I wrote all these words, you take the place of articulation and add ization, so that's quite simple. Okay, now we should have understood the whole story. We listed, explained and exemplified all suprasegmental features. We trained a lot with our students and we have achieved marvelous results. Katrin, how long have you been in our class? Um, four weeks. Four weeks only, and you know such a lot about phonetics. Well, four weeks and four sessions, that's enormous. I hope you've been enjoying the class up to this point. So, I leave the final words up to you. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I can say that although you have to learn quite a lot of theoretical stuff, phonetics is really fun and interesting. So, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.